In a world filled with magic, we see a group of soldiers as they go up against a demonic being known as the Corpse God. The Corpse God summons magical weapons, launching them against the soldiers, and easily taking them out. The captain receives news that the legendary hero is on his way, so he orders his men to retreat, knowing that only the hero can take on such a threat. The legendary hero, Sagrua, makes his way to the Corpse God. They engage in combat, and the Corpse God uses his magic to attack the hero, but he fails to deal damage to Sagrua, who uses his sword to defend himself. The Corpse God gathers the souls of the dead, summoning an undead dragon that charges at Sagrua, but the hero easily cuts it in half with his enchanted sword. They continue to exchange blows, and Sagrua manages to push him back. Seeing that he's at a disadvantage, the Corpse God summons a skeleton army to defeat the hero. Sagrua uses his evil eye, allowing him to see the souls of the dead, and we learn that the Corpse God possesses the same ability. Sagrua charges at the skeleton army, jumping over them and launching a fireball toward the ceiling. This causes the ceiling to collapse, raining rocks down on his enemies. Sagrua manages to land a hit on the Corpse God, exposing a brain in a jar, which is revealed to be its true form. The Corpse God prepares to use a powerful spell, but Sagrua charges with all of his might. He thrusts his sword, managing to pierce through it, causing an enormous explosion that pierces through the dark sky, but his memory suddenly becomes cloudy as he struggles to remember the result of the battle, and it turns out that the corpse god used reincarnation magic. As he wakes up in an alley, with a wound on his neck, the corpse god looks around, struggling to understand what's going on, and he finds himself in a modern city, unable to recognize anything. He is suddenly spotted by a drone, and the operator, Kuruya, is surprised, because he had confirmed that the boy was already dead. He calls his team, informing them that their target is still alive, and Kuruya wonders how the boy can still be walking around with a slit throat. Meanwhile, the corpse god is still having a hard time taking everything in, wondering where he is, because everything is so foreign to him. He observes the people, seeing that everyone is happy, so he thinks that this world must be peaceful. He thinks about his own world, unsure about how he can return, but at that moment, he is approached by two policemen, who try to talk to him, but he can't understand what they're saying. He slowly starts to understand them, as he pulls linguistic information from his body's brain. He tells the officers that he's okay, and introduces himself as Polka. The policemen are shocked to see the wound on his neck, telling him he needs medical assistance. But a strange girl suddenly steps on the officer's head, glad to see that Polka is alive, grabbing him by the arm, and dashing off with him. They reach an alley, where the girl introduces herself as Misaki. Polka begins to remember who she is, when Misaki suddenly throws him into the air, claiming to be checking if he is really alive. But she suddenly pulls out a crowbar, revealing that she was the one who killed him the first time. Polka starts running away, while Kuruya watches them through his drone, wondering why someone would pay to have a 16-year-old boy killed. But he knows that they won't get paid unless Polka dies. Polka becomes exhausted, commenting on his new body's limitations, since it took all of his strength just to run away, and it seems to have no capacity for magic. He thinks about what he should do, knowing that one fatal wound would lead to his death. Misaki shows up behind him, throwing her knives, which he narrowly dodges. She seems to be enjoying the hunt, charging at Polka who struggles to block her attacks. He tries to run away, but he falls as Misaki throws a dagger, which hits his leg, but he gets back up, pulling out the dagger and throwing it back at Misaki. Misaki is impressed, as she admits that he intimidates her, fearing that she will fall for him if she's not careful. Polka enters a strange room, wondering what it's for, when Misaki catches up to him, throwing a dagger at his leg, causing him to fall to the ground. She reveals that it was once an execution ground for the Yakuza, and there are rumors that ghosts haunt the room, so people try to avoid it. Polka confirms that the rumors are true, as he uses his evil eye to see the souls of the dead. He realizes that the evil eye is a power of the soul, so he can still use it in Polka's body. Misaki is about to finish him off, but he gathers the powers from the souls in the room, calling forth a monstrous arm, which impales Misaki, and instantly kills her. Back in the other world, the corpse god is seemingly defeated, but Sagrua wonders about his final spell. Doubting that the corpse god was truly defeated, because his soul vanished too quickly. His companion informs him that the soul of the corpse god is no longer in their world, 
but the hero still has his doubts. In a flashback, we learn that the corpse god could not live a peaceful life because of the evil eye. He was sold by his parents to the court sorcerers, and he fought countless battles as a necromancer until the empire fell, but all he really wanted was peace. He eventually lives in peace with humans, even finding love, but the soldiers start hunting down necromancers because they enslave the spirits of the dead. They end up killing the people close to him during their hunt, causing him to become enraged, as he goes on a quest for vengeance, tormenting people for centuries, and killing countless soldiers, while he stays in an abandoned coal mine. Despite all the bloodshed, he still desires peace, but even as he waited for centuries, he still couldn't find it. He couldn't die a natural death, so he waited for someone who could defeat him, so that he could be reincarnated in a new body, and finally find peace. Back in the present, Polka is surprised to see that Misaki is already dead, wanting to ask her some questions, and he is worried that he will be hunted down by the police if they find her body. Kuruya saw everything with his drone, and he starts questioning his sanity, when he receives a call from his boss, Clarissa, asking what's taking the mission so long, so he sends her the video file of what just happened. In another flashback, we learn that Misaki's parents truly loved her, allowing her to enjoy her childhood, but her life was ruined when her parents were murdered before her eyes by a man named Jinba. Because of this, she trained to be an assassin, eventually finding the man and making him suffer. Misaki reveals that she is not killing him for revenge, but because she enjoys killing her targets, which just happen to be bad people. She eventually receives the mission to kill Polka, and she accepts it, wanting to know what it's like to kill someone innocent. Misaki hits him with a crowbar, making her realize that killing innocent people is also fun. But she starts to question her existence, thinking that she's better off dead, even thinking about taking her own life, when suddenly, she receives a call from Kuruya, informing her that the target is still alive. Back in the present, Misaki wakes up, surprised to see that her wound is healed. Polka reveals she is technically dead but she was reborn through magic. They are suddenly surrounded by a group of men, as Clarissa appears before them. Clarissa hugs her, checking to see if she is alive, but realizes she has no pulse, as Polka explains she is pretty much like a zombie. Forty minutes earlier, Kuruya tells Clarissa about Polka's whereabouts, so she finds him, asking him about the sigils that she's seeing, as Polka uses his magic to heal Masaki. He asks them who they are, and Clarissa claims that they are Masaki's friends. Polka reveals that Masaki's brain and soul are still intact, but someone needs to use resurrection magic on her, but everyone is confused, because nobody can use magic in this world. He wants everyone to think that they were merely hallucinating, as he threatens to attack them with his weapons. They point their guns at him, but he pins one of them down with a huge skeletal hand, saying that he has no idea how fragile humans are without magic. They suddenly learn that a nearby building is on fire, and Polka's magical eye sees it, but it immediately gets sliced by one of Clarissa's companions. Clarissa tells him that the building is a safe haven for orphan children, and Polka remembers the children that were dear to him in his past life, so he decides to help out. Kuruya's drone leads the way, and he uses his magic to swing around the town, allowing him to travel faster. Upon reaching the building, he uses his evil eye, allowing him to see the life force of the children that are trapped. He uses a skeletal arm to throw him into the building, where he sees four souls with the children who are struggling. They are the souls of the parents of the orphan children. He asks for their help, making skeletal bodies for them to possess. The skeletons rescue the children, putting them on a huge skeletal hand that lays them down on the ground. Polka manages to escape, but the event gets posted on social media, and everyone learns about Polka's skeletons. Kuruya thinks about what kind of person Polka is, because he didn't value Misaki's life, but he saved the children from the building, making him think that Polka is different from them. He tells Clarissa that she shouldn't mess with Polka, seeing him as a monster, and Clarissa agrees with him, telling him that Misaki is about to wake up. Back in the present, Polka realizes that children still suffer in this world, so he wonders how he can find peace. Clarissa asks him what peace means to him, telling him that she can achieve peace by having lots of money. She asks Polka about his goal, and he explains that he knows nothing about the place, but he would like to use his necromancy to earn some money, wanting power and a place to belong, saying that it would help him attain peace. Clarissa wants him to join her team, she is sure that he is not the same person that they wanted to kill, 
and she offers to help him adjust to the world. The videos of Polka's skeletons continue to circulate online, which impresses Misaki. Polka uses his skeletons to help move furniture into their new home, and they hang out together. Misaki reveals that she is actually thrilled to hang out with the man who killed her, because she's never been killed before. We learn that Clarissa owns the building they're in, and it's called the Torture Building, and it's actually filled with ghosts. Polka begins to doubt that he is in another world, because the animals are similar to the ones he used to know, but he is happy because the Geldwood religion doesn't exist in this world, explaining how he used to be hunted down by the religion, because he was an abomination known as the Corpse God. Polka thinks he will finally be able to achieve peace, if he can find the person who wanted to have his body killed. Clarissa knows the person, but keeps it a secret, allowing him to use the building in exchange. Polka decides to investigate on his own, knowing that Clarissa won't accept any more contracts on his life. But Korea reveals that Clarissa is not the only intermediary for assassins, although he acknowledges that not many people could kill Polka, although he mentions a person called Lemmings, but quickly dismisses the idea. Kuruya wonders if it was a good idea to bring Misaki back to life, and Polka reveals that the body's owner told him to forgive her, revealing that his soul is now in the drone. Polka has the power to make people's souls inhabit vessels, and he admits that human lives are like toys to him, making Kuruya think he is trouble. Polka thinks about earning money, asking them about the jobs in the world. Misaki suggests doing some assassinations, saying he should be good at it, because he was able to kill her. At that moment, they have a visitor who wants to meet Misaki, and he asks for her help, because he is being targeted by hitmen from another gang. Misaki tells him that she is in the middle of another job, but Polka interrupts, accepting the request, and this makes Misaki accept it as well. They receive information that the hitmen are in an abandoned warehouse, revealing that they used to work for Jinba. Misaki dashes toward the warehouse, but she immediately gets ambushed. Misaki fights them off, calling them limps, but she is suddenly shot from behind by the man who asked for her help. The man reveals that they are there to avenge Jinba, ordering his men to kill her, as he turns his back. He sees Polka, who grabs everyone's attention, as Misaki grabs hold of a thug's leg. Polka informs them that Misaki is a zombie, so she can't be killed that easily. Misaki gets back on her feet, and sends a thug flying, while Kuruya calls Polka, asking him if he knew that it was a trap. Polka says that he didn't, but he accepted the request because there were souls of children that were haunting the man. He summons his giant skeletal arms, crushing all the men into a boulder, and allowing the children's spirits to rest in peace. After that, Misaki is happy to see that the bullet holes in her body have already healed, and Kuruya wonders why Polka listened to the children's souls, despite seeing human lives as toys. But Polka reveals that he still takes good care of human lives, because they can make children smile. This makes Kuruya realize that they are different from Polka, seeing themselves as scum, because of the way they treat their targets. The other members of Jinba's gang want to get revenge, opening their armory, but Lemmings attacks them, wiping out everyone in their gang. Polka reads a book about vampires, claiming that they are real in his world, and he tells Masaki that he could turn her into one if he has enough mana, which makes her excited. Meanwhile, Clarissa receives a phone call from the client who ordered the hit on Polka, but she decides to terminate their contract. We see a man named Kozaburo, as he apologizes because he is unable to pay for his beer which costs 60,000 yen, while a drunk man named Tsubaki is looking for Clarissa, as he mentions that bars are ripping off the customers. Back in their room, Polka explains that Misaki's body can self-repair and resist decomposition, as well as being slightly stronger than before. He advises her to eat raw meat if she ever gets seriously injured, and reveals that her saliva can now cause paralysis. She tries it out on him, biting him, which causes him to fall to the ground. Misaki asks Kuruya if he also wants to try, but he refuses, calling her a monster. The word monster reminds Polka about the hero who defeated him, thinking about whether there are any people like him in this world. The police investigate the area where Polka crushed the thugs. Lemmings makes his appearance, shattering the boulder that contained the thugs, before disappearing. The police hear the noise, rushing to the scene, and they find the bodies of the thugs. Meanwhile, we see Kozaburo, as he finishes beating up the men that were scamming him. He receives a call, and so does Tsubaki at the bar, who immediately leaves after receiving the call. 
Polka realizes that the world isn't so different from where he came from, so he starts to think that the two worlds could be connected. Kuruya mentions the thugs he killed, but Polka reveals that they are actually still alive, but they might have gone insane while trapped in the boulder. Kozaburo and Tsubaki make their way to the scene and see the bodies of the thugs that look like human knots. They begin their investigation, revealing that they are detectives of a special police force. At the police station, we learn that Tsubaki and Kozaburo have plenty of experience in dealing with paranormal cases. Tsubaki reveals that there are three suspects that are still at large, the Grim Reaper, the Fire-Breathing Bug, and Lemmings. Tsubaki reveals that they found a footprint of Lemmings at the scene of the incident. They are also looking into the case of the skeletons that saved the orphan children, thinking that it is connected to the Fire-Breathing Bug, who probably started the fire. They consider the possibility that the two incidents are connected, but despite the strange nature of the incidents, Tsubaki tells them not to panic, reminding them that the criminals they've caught have turned out to be just ordinary humans. Meanwhile, Polka puts the soul of his body's original owner in a stuffed animal so that Kuruya can use his drone again. He apologizes to the original Polka for assuming his identity, promising to make it up to him. Misaki sees the stuffed animal, finding it cute, and hugs it, which makes it turn red. Kuruya wonders what it's trying to say, and Polka says that he could make human vocal cords to help him speak, but he doesn't have enough mana. He reveals that, as a necromancer, he can obtain more mana by exercising ghosts, explaining that the souls in their building are a great source of mana. But Kuruya says that there aren't many other buildings that are similar. However, Polka says that it's okay, because the gemstones in this world are an even greater source of mana. They go to a jewelry store, where Polka is surprised to see that the gemstones are incredibly expensive, saying that the gemstones in his world are super cheap in comparison. He plans to save money to buy all of the gemstones in the store, but the shopkeeper tells him that it would cost him almost 4 billion yen to buy everything. After they leave the store, Misaki asks him why he didn't just drain the mana from the stones, and Polka reveals that it would cause the stones to crumble, making it unfair to the shopkeeper. They suddenly encounter Kozaburo, who immediately lunges past them, trying to grab the drone. Meanwhile, Tsubaki finally meets Clarissa at the bar, telling her about the human knots and the building fire, wanting to know if her group is involved with the cases. Kozaburo apologizes for startling them, knowing that Kuruya is the one controlling the drone, and he tries to talk to Kuruya, but Polka interrupts him, telling him that Kuruya is his friend. But Kozaburo calls Kuruya scum, telling Polka he should cut his ties with him. Polka remembers his friends that were killed during his past life, so he uses his powers, allowing him to grab the drone from Kozaburo, who becomes curious to learn more about him. Kuruya warns them that Kozaburo is extremely dangerous, having witnessed him destroy a gang by himself. He warns Polka not to use his powers, claiming he won't be able to live a peaceful life if he does. Kozaburo begins to question Polka, which worries Kuruya, because he knows that if Polka reveals his connection to Clarissa, it would trigger an investigation. So Kuruya calls Kozaburo, telling him that Polka and Misaki are just his gaming buddies. He surrounds Kozaburo with drones, warning him that the video of him hassling innocent kids will go viral on the internet. But Kozaburo is unfazed, calling Kuruya cocky, as he reveals Kuruya sold out his old buddies to save his own skin. Misaki suddenly appears behind Kozaburo, knocking him down, and claiming she was just defending herself against a creep. She runs away with Polka, while Kozaburo tries to chase after them, but he can't find them, because they used Polka's skeletal arm to help them escape. Kuruya tells Polka that Kozaburo was telling the truth, admitting that he will reveal their secrets just to save his own life, but Polka tells him his life is more valuable than his secrets. At the police station, Kozaburo asks an officer to investigate Misaki's footprints on his body. She immediately recognizes it, matching it to a footprint they found at the scene of the human knot case, causing Kozaburo to get excited, as he finds the case intriguing. A veteran officer reveals that he once saw lemmings in the past, claiming that he took down a group of men while they were raining bullets on him. The officer doubts that they could take him on, but he knows that the special division is all they have. Meanwhile, Lemmings has been invisible inside the police station the whole time, and he checks out the photo of Misaki's footprint. Tsubaki is now drunk at the bar, talking about the paranormal cases he handled, and even mentions the skeletons in the building fire. 
Clarissa knows that he is doing this to taunt their group, but they think that they can't let him dig too deep. The bar girls consider warning Polka, but he happens to arrive at that moment. Tsubaki notices them, and he receives a message with the description of the person involved in the human knot's case, which seems to match Misaki, so he asks the pair to spend time with him. Meanwhile, Korea sees Kozaburo heading to the bar, where the group seems to be enjoying their time together. Korea warns them to leave, but he's too late, and Kozaburo has already arrived with his men. He joins the group, as Tsubaki reveals that they just want to ask them some questions, but the room suddenly darkens, and the pair immediately hides from the detectives. Clarissa insists it wasn't one of her tricks, while Polka uses his night vision to see in the dark. But he becomes afraid as he sees Lemmings on the ceiling. As Clarissa lights a candle, Lemmings makes his entrance, seemingly ready to fight. Clarissa knows that he is not there to kill anyone, but Kozaburo thinks about beating him up, since he is a wanted person. Polka uses his evil eye, seeing countless ghosts around Lemmings, and he realizes that he killed all of them. Lemmings attacks the officers, blowing them away like ragdolls, and Kozaburo tries to fight back, but his attacks don't work against Lemmings, who doesn't even take him seriously. Lemmings dashes toward Misaki, taking her away, as Polka thinks about using his powers to get her back, but he's too worried about the officers seeing his magic. Kozaburo continues to pursue Lemmings, but he is no match for him. Polka realizes that Lemmings is a human who is pushed beyond his limits, much like Sagrua, so he knows that he can't stop him, but he uses his magic to attack Lemmings anyway. Tsubaki sees the sigils, wondering what they are, but Clarissa covers the candle to darken the room. Polka grabs onto Misaki using his skeletal arms, saying that they should escape, while Tsubaki uses the flashlight on his phone, allowing him to see the skeletal arm. Lemmings charges at Polka, who tries to take him down with his magic, but he fails to land a hit on Lemmings, who can also apparently see in the dark. Lemmings manages to break the skeletal arm holding onto Misaki, and Misaki panics as he approaches her. However, he whispers something to her, and they start talking casually. Misaki tries to paralyze him with her bite, but she can't bite through his bandages. She suddenly stabs his leg with the fork that contains her saliva, making him dazed, as Polka uses the soul's haunting Lemmings to cast a spell, summoning a giant skeleton to attack him and forcing Lemmings to flee. After that, Lemmings reports to his boss, Takaru, telling him that Jinba was already dead, and that Polka is still alive. Kuruya is surprised to learn that they have survived after encountering Lemmings, who got his name because of his ability to go anywhere like a rat. Polka thanks Misaki for helping him out, and Misaki says that it's okay because he also does the same thing for her. He remembers his master's words, about how he should help people if he wants to, knowing he is going to live a long life as a necromancer, so he should just do what he wants, without thinking about how long something is going to last. Polka tells his friends that he wants to learn more about them, saying that he wants to enjoy peace with them. Polka decides to start a business, where he will use his magic to make money, demonstrating that he can make a soul possess a pen to write its ideas on paper. He shows them the sign for his business, and Kuruya doesn't like the idea, but the soul has something else in mind. Polka starts acting as a fortune teller, impressing the people with his abilities, as he allows the soul to guide him, and this allows them to make a fortune. It's revealed that the soul actually knows how to do fortune telling, even telling them how to do it. Kuruya does his research, passing on the information to Polka, who uses his evil eye to gather even more information from the spirits with the client. They split the profits between them, even giving some to the real Polka, but the real Polka doesn't want any because he didn't work for it. Kuruya reveals that Polka was from a rich family, as a group of men enter their room. The twins named Kazuki and Shizuki greet them, calling Polka their uncle. Polka thinks about fooling them, so he covers his head, telling them that he is the corpse god, but they don't believe him, seeing him as a weirdo. Kazuki thinks that Polka ran away from home, because of the people around him. She sits with them, wanting to try out their fortune telling, but they tell her to leave and visit their shop when it opens. Kazuki refuses to leave, calling them peasants, and she starts to argue with Kuruya, but her bodyguards stop her, because they know that Kuruya is recording the conversation. Kuruya proceeds to provoke her, but Polka tells him to stop, because he notices that Kazuki is about to cry. He hugs the twins, telling them they both have a future, and promises to protect them. 
Polka talks to the misshapen spirit behind the twins, telling it not to worry, as it continues to beg someone to help the children. As they leave, Polka notes that the spirit is not evil, but it has gone half mad. Kuruya tells him he has a soft spot for children, and Polka reveals that they remind him of the children in his past life. Kuruya gives them information about the Shinoyama group, where Polka is the second son of the patriarch named Rosen, and he could claim a share of Rosen's inheritance if he passes away. Kuruya speculates that this must be why someone ordered a hit on him, thinking that a relative must want him dead, so going home could be dangerous for him. Polka tells them about his bodyguards during his past life, and he tries to disguise a skeleton as a guard, but it doesn't look close to a human, so they turn to Misaki, thinking she would be a good fit. On their way home, the twins encounter Takaru, who asks them about Polka, and he learns that Polka is returning home, so he looks forward to seeing him. He warns the twins to take care, saying it would be a shame if there was another accident, like the one that happened to their sister, revealing her to be the spirit that is following them. Polka and Misaki visit the Shinoyama house, and Polka is amazed by its size. They are greeted by the twins, as well as Takaru, who asks about his companion, and to his surprise, Misaki politely introduces herself. They move to the dining room, and Misaki makes up a story of how Polka saved her life when she was about to jump off a building, and it turns out she actually comes from a well-off family that once helped Takaru when he was younger. We learn more about the Shinoyama family. Polka is the son of Rosen's second wife, while Kuruya warns him about Takaru, who is actually his nephew. Kuruya mentions he is 26, but also the president of the Shinoyama security group, which has a notorious reputation for being shady. Misaki is suddenly hugged by Takaru's wife Kiri, who finds her story touching, offering to help her if she is ever in trouble, and they welcome her as a friend. Polka is impressed at how well Misaki is playing her part, so he wants to do his best as well, but Shizuki suddenly interrogates him about the shark on his shoulder, after seeing it could move. Polka wonders where the rest of his family is, and Kazuki tells him they are all at work, so they are the only ones at the house. But Rosen suddenly enters, reminding them that he is also there, and Kiri says he shouldn't be walking around with his health. Polka apologizes to him for running away from home, but he is just glad that he is back. He says he overheard Misaki's story, and wants to hear more about it, so he tells Polka to follow him. They move to a private room, and Polka tells him about what he has been up to since he left. Polka thinks he is doing a good job fooling his father, but Rosen suddenly asks him who he is. Polka is confused, and Rosen says that although he looks like his son, he is sure he is a different person. Polka says he is being ridiculous, but Rosen suddenly pulls a sword on him, saying that a father can recognize his own son. He asks if the real Polka is still alive, but suddenly, Polka senses that the twins are in danger, mentioning how he promised to protect them, and Rosen lets him go. As Polka runs off, there is a mysterious girl in the room that tells Rosen he should have killed the imposter while he had the chance, but he says he just couldn't do it. There is suddenly an explosion in the distance, and there is a flashback to the twins, and Kazuki tells her sister that she lost her purse in the forest. Their sister Suzuka goes out and finds the purse, but she ends up coming across her cousins, plotting the murder of the twins. Suzuka rushes to warn them, but ends up being burnt to death, and ending up as the spirit that follows them around, begging for someone to save them. Back in the present, the twins hear the explosion, and they are told there is a fire, and the man tells them to evacuate. As the twins follow the man away, Suzuka begs them not to go. Meanwhile, we see Tsubaki and Kozaburo, as they pay a visit to a man named Tenya, a troublemaker also known as the Phantom Solitaire, to see if he has any information about the fire incident. Tenya is surprised seeing the skeletons, and Tsubaki mentions they have connected the case to the fire-breathing bug, mentioning the signature he leaves behind. Tsubaki theorizes that the fire-breathing bug must infiltrate their targets in disguise, taking their time to prepare and strike when no one's looking, like a bug chewing through a house. The kids are led to an escape tunnel, but Kazuki realizes something is wrong. The man reveals his true intentions, while Suzuka tries to stop him, but can't actually do anything. As the man approaches the twins, Misaki suddenly appears, kicking the man away, and telling Suzuka she is there to save the kids, even though she can't see her. The man gets back up, removing his disguise, mentioning how he was looking forward to feasting on the kids. 
Misaki tells the twins to run, so they quickly get away. The man introduces himself as Zaku, the killer of killers, and he seems to be aware of Misaki's identity. He suddenly lights the whole room on fire, but Misaki charges straight at him, causing him to wonder if she is even human. Misaki finds it strange he isn't going after the kids, but the man reveals there is nowhere for them to run. The twins wonder if they are being punished for what happened to Suzuka, and they swear to apologize to her if they see her again. The ceiling collapses above them, but Polka manages to arrive just in time, using his skeletal arms to catch the debris. He assures them they have a bright future, and that Suzuka is not mad at them. They manage to make it outside, and Takara thinks about cleaning up the mess. We see the cousin who was behind the attack, thinking that the fire-breathing bug must have taken out the twins, but he is suddenly boxed in as a motorcycle approaches, and the man is taken care of. Back at the mansion, Zaku is surprised the twins managed to survive. He decides to retreat, but Polka catches him. He is disguised as a maid, but Polka can see his soul and notes that he is being haunted by the servants who he stole faces from. Misaki suddenly appears, kicking him into a wall, and she is glad to be a zombie, which helped her survive the fire. Zaka tells them not to get cocky, using his gloves and starting another fire. He claims that as a bug, he will persist no matter what. Polka wonders if he has enough mana to break through, but he suddenly senses another presence, and Lemmings suddenly appears, taking out the man. But he signals them to keep quiet, and he vanishes once again, leaving them feeling confused. Zaku ends up getting taken in by the police, and he thinks about how to make his escape. But the fire-breathing bug's signature suddenly appears on the roof, and we learn he is a fake. He suddenly bursts into flames, causing an explosion, and we see a mysterious girl that watches from a distance. Rosen asks Polka to explain everything, but Polka can tell they are being listened to, saying they should have some privacy. Rosen orders his servants to leave, and Polka tells him the truth, revealing he is from another world, even showing his magical eye to add credibility to his story. Rosen points his sword at Misaki, since she was the one who killed his son, but the real Polka interferes, trying to tell his father to stop. Rosen realizes that his son is in the shark toy, and he starts laughing, seeing how much his son enjoys being in the toy, so he puts his sword away. Rosen suggests moving the corpse god's soul into an artificial body, but the real Polka wants to be the one to have the robot body, saying he wants the perks that come with it. Rosen thinks that since Polka is still a target, it's actually safer having the corpse god in his body, and since they helped save his grandkids, he lets them off the hook. Later, Misaki grabs onto the real Polka, offering her apology to him, and he seems to accept it. At that moment, the twins rush over, thanking Polka and Misaki for saving them. Misaki is touched to hear this, but Polka tells them not to thank him, and that they should thank their guardian spirit instead. As they walk away, Misaki wonders if he will make a contract with Suzuka, who is now at peace, but Polka tells her that it's not yet time. Meanwhile at the detention facility, Kozaburo and Tsubaki learn that the real fire-breathing bug killed her imitator, but Tenya thinks that it's nothing, as he is more interested in the skeleton case. He wants the detectives to show him a video of the skeleton, but Tsubaki tells him he needs to trade information for it, but Tenya says he will just have to see it for himself as the lights go out. Kozaburo turns on a flashlight, but they are surprised to see Tenya has disappeared. The detectives hold an emergency meeting, informing everyone about the Phantom Solitaire's escape. We learn that Tenya is responsible for a number of crimes, but he became notorious after he kidnapped the Prime Minister, dropping a black cloth onto him and making him disappear without a trace. When the Prime Minister was released, he had no memory of the kidnapping, saying he just found himself in a manga cafe. Tanya ended up turning himself in, saying he was bothered by the audience's indifference because he wanted the attention of the real magicians. Tanya wanted one of them to reach out to him so he can have proof that real magic exists, but he didn't hear anything from them. The police are baffled by his statement, thinking he's gone nuts, and they beat him up before taking him into custody. To this day, Tsubaki still doesn't know if Tanya was telling the truth, noting that his superhuman technique wasn't even the worst thing about him. Meanwhile, Polka buys a radio, wanting to use it to gather information. He turns it on, and they are surprised to hear news about Zaka's death, and they also hear news about Tanya's escape. The police are also surprised to hear news about the Phantom Solitaire's escape, because Tsubaki had imposed media restrictions. 
Kuruya recognizes the Phantom Solitaire, saying he is an urban legend like Lemmings, but unlike Lemmings, he has received exposure in the media. The police are surprised to learn that they can't change the channel, and the reporter removes his glasses, revealing that he is Tenya, as he announces his return to the public, telling everyone his performance will resume the following week. He ends the broadcast, and Tsubaki thinks he bought airtime from a prisoner known as the Grocer, who does business even while behind bars. Tenya approaches a man he recognizes as the fire-breathing bug. The man doesn't talk to him, and Tenya suddenly gets a call. He realizes it's from the man, but he's confused about why they don't just talk in person. The man wonders how he was found out, and suddenly tries to attack Tenya. The man burns the area around them, and Tenya is impressed by his ability. Tenya uses his carts to defend himself, scattering carts around the area, as he gleefully runs away, saying he likes waste. Tenya holds onto balloons to escape the flame, but the balloons start bursting, so he falls to the ground, and seems to get consumed by the fire. But Tenya is still alive, and he starts running away, as he uses a shield of carts to block the flames, and disappear. He reappears on top of the man's umbrella, revealing how he just fell for his illusion, and he can tell there is also a trick behind the man's fire, disappointed he can't use real magic. Tenya tells him that something foreign has entered their world, and suggests the man will see it as a bug that he will want to eliminate. Meanwhile, Polka's niece, Sail, visits them, together with her attendant Xiaoyu, and she tells them she will be staying with them. Polka wonders what she's doing there, and she reveals that her sharks burned up, making them confused, as Misaki starts talking to her about sharks. So Xiaoyu explains how her bedroom was lost in the fire, along with all her shark toys. He shows them a message from Rosen, who asks Polka to let them stay in their place, saying it would be convenient to have two of his people in the building. Polka can sense that more people are watching their building, thinking Rosen decided to send his security, but he considers the possibility that Sayo could be behind the attempt on Polka's life. The next day, Polka finds Sayo in her shark's sleeping bag, saying she has no energy for the day. Misaki thinks about cleaning up an empty room for their new housemates and buying a mattress for them, but they claim that they don't need one since Seo is happy with her sleeping bag and Xiaoyu says he can sleep while standing up. Xiaoyu states that he will look after Seo, preparing a meal for her as he reveals that the Shinoyama residence is buzzing with police. We see Tsubaki and Kozaburo interviewing Takaru about the fire. Tsubaki suggests it could have been the work of the fire-breathing bug and Takaru reveals that the fire-breathing bug has always been a thorn in their side, causing trouble for their group, so he wonders when the police would capture him. He reminds Tsubaki about Tenya's escape, and he tells them that they should be looking for Tenya instead of chatting with him. The detectives walk away, as Kozaburo states that Takaru seems to be the kind of guy who uses violence to solve problems. Tsubaki says they might have to throw down with the Shinoyamas, showing a picture of Polka with the family. They know Polka is the younger son of Rosen, and they think that either Polka or Takaru could be at the center of the cases they've had for the past month. Seo and Xiaoyu move to another room, and they are left there for the evening. While Seo is sleeping, Xiaoyu gets up, listening to Polka and Kuruya as they discuss what to do with them. He doesn't know why Rosen trusts Polka, but he is determined to expose Polka, thinking he's up to something. We learn that Rosen ordered him to go to the building, and he revealed that Polka is a fake but he's not their enemy. So he gave Xiaoyu the mission to keep Seo and the fake Polka safe, but Xiaoyu is reluctant. Xiaoyu considers killing both Polkas, thinking he would make a better son for Rosen. In a flashback, we see Xiaoyu lying on a hospital bed with his limbs cut off. His father thinks about turning him into a Tingyu, which is a living child whose body is used for cultivating poison. Xiaoyu begins to lose his mind after hearing this, but Rosen arrives telling his father not to be so barbaric. His father explains that the people in their clan are just tools, so Rosen offers to buy Xiaoyu with his group's latest tech. Rosen thinks about giving him some prosthetics, and he smiles as he takes him in. Back in the present, Xiaoyu continues to eavesdrop, while Clarissa reveals that the Shinoyamas also have connections in the criminal society. She thinks they were just hired to kill Polka, because the family's assassins can't get involved in the situation. Clarissa knows that Xiaoyu's family, the Leis, serve as the Shinoyama's assassins, and they are known for using special methods to get the job done. Xiaoyu hears Polka talking about a dragon from his world, who takes the form of a beautiful woman to seduce royalty, but she fell in love with a general, so they eloped when the empire fell. 
they start talking about more dragons, and Xiaoyu becomes confused, thinking they're just talking about works of fiction. In a meeting, Tsubaki tells the police about Polka, saying he is with the girl who left footprints in the human knot's case. Kozaburu mentions his connections to Clarissa and Kuruya, and Tsubaki tells everyone about Polka's fortune-telling business. Later, as Polka prepares for his fortune-telling session, the detectives suddenly arrive, and Tsubaki asks him to read his fortune. Tsubaki claims he will use the fortune to prevent future murders, but Polka says he can't see the future, and that he only traces paths. As Polka begins the reading, Polka tells Tsubaki about his background, and Tsubaki suspects that somebody is feeding him the information, thinking he has an earpiece under his hood. But we learn that his magical eye is just looking at Kuria's monitor, as he searches for information. He mentions the wound from Tsubaki's past, which is weighing him down, and Tsubaki asks how he can heal it. He becomes surprised as the spirit in the pen starts moving, and it writes something on the paper. Tsubaki is triggered seeing it, and he grabs onto Polka, asking him what he knows. In a flashback, we see Tsubaki talking to a mysterious person, who asks him to memorize a symbol on a piece of paper. He tells Tsubaki not to forget it, as he burns it away, telling him not to show the symbol to anyone else, because it's the signpost they must follow, and a one-way ticket to death. Back in the present, he asks Polka why he drew the symbol, but Polka tells him he is just showing him the path. He lets Polka go, and he pays him more than what is expected, bidding Polka farewell, as he starts walking away. Xiaoyu wonders what was written on the piece of paper, so he thinks about looking into the fake Polka secrets. He asks for permission to leave, saying he will buy dinner, and Sayo lets him leave. Meanwhile, Tsubaki is eating with Kozaburo, and Kozaburo asks him why he got worked up during the reading, wanting to know what was written on the piece of paper, but Tsubaki says that he will tell him in the future. Xiaoyu sees them as they leave the restaurant, and he thinks about following them a bit longer. We see a burning building, as a man opens up a safe, taking a scroll out of it. But as he turns around, he sees the fire-breathing bug walking towards him singing a lullaby. The man is taken out, and the fire-breathing bug leaves as everything burns, and his signature appears on the wall. But Tenya suddenly appears, taking the scroll from the man's body. It's the same symbol from the reading, and Tenya gets an idea for the theme of his comeback performance. Back in their building, Kuruya wonders why Tsubaki became upset, and Polka reveals that it was because of the spirit in the pen, saying he has no idea what was written on the paper. Tsubaki goes to Clarissa, asking her about their mutual friend, but she has no idea what he's talking about. Tsubaki says he was an inspector named Hozaragi, which is revealed to be the spirit in the pen. Clarissa remembers him, and Tsubaki suggests that Hozaragi may have recruited Polka, thinking she may have been involved somehow but Clarissa says she knows nothing about it, and that she's just letting Polka stay in her building to build connections with his family. Tsubaki thinks Hozaragi is still alive, so he wants to clean up the police force so that Hozaragi will return. Xiaoyu overhears the conversation, and he thinks about investigating the bar's staff. Kuruya is surprised to learn that Hozaragi was an inspector who investigated police corruption, and Polka asks him what he wrote on the paper, but Hozaragi demands a payment of 1 million yen, which they don't have. Hozaragi reveals that the case involves one of his regrets, so Polka has no choice but to help him, because it's a part of their pact. At the detention facility, Tanya goes to the grocer, wanting to buy information about the symbol. We learn that the grocer comes from a family of merchants with a century of history, and he is the fifth generation owner of the family business. He has a weird prison cell because he has gained power by dealing with the state, and everything is on the table when it comes to making deals with him. The grocer gives him a free sample, saying the symbols have meanings. He reveals that one diagonal line is a sword, and the old knight order in Europe used a similar insignia, but he refuses to go on, saying Tanya must pay to learn more. The day of Tanya's performance arrives, and everyone notices blimps outside. They all display the symbol, which surprises Polka, because it represents the emblem of the fallen empire from his world. Tsubaki tells Kozaburo that it's the same symbol Polka showed him, so Kozaburo thinks the Phantom Solitaire is connected to Hozaragi's case, and Tsubaki considers the possibility that he is being targeted by Tenya. At that moment, an officer informs Tsubaki that the police HQ is asking for him. Tenya listens to the news while on top of a blimp, but the reporter states that the blimps must have been the work of foreign artists, so he becomes disappointed. 
While he was in the detention facility, we learned that the grocer charged him 3 billion yen for the information, explaining that Tanya could earn 6 billion yen over his lifetime if he really wanted to earn money, and the information will shape his destiny, but it could end up destroying him if mishandled, so he thinks 3 billion is a reasonable price. However, Tanya decides to find the answer himself, paying the grocer for his help to fly several blimps. He reads a manga on top of a blimp, but he suddenly gets shot by a sniper, who is surprised that she actually hit him. However, her spotter says she missed, as it's revealed that the body was just a dummy. Tanya goes on air, reporting the incident to everyone, and he accuses the police of making an attempt on his life. He tells everyone that someone wanted to kill him because of the symbol, so he thinks there is a conspiracy or secret society involved. Tanya offers to give a 300 million yen reward to any person who will tell him about the symbol, saying he will give his contact details soon as he ends the broadcast. Polka notes that the situation is now a mess, as they wonder what they should do next, but Sayo asks them what is happening, because she heard something about empires and reincarnation. So Polka explains his story to her, saying he will return the body to the original Polka soon. Kuruya thinks Sayo wouldn't believe that story, but she says she believes him, because she noticed he is nothing like the Polka she knows. She goes to the bathroom with the real Polka, and they talk about whether they could trust her with the information. Polka reveals he can alter someone's memories, by making a spirit remove a part of their soul, but this could affect the target's brain. He says it wasn't hard to do in his old world, but he doesn't know if the humans in this world are different, so he is afraid he could end up destroying Seo's mind. As they talk, they suddenly notice that Misaki is no longer with them. Misaki joins Seo as she takes a shower, telling her she killed the real Polka, but Seo knows Polka has already forgiven her, since she knows he has a gentle nature. And they end up becoming friends, as Misaki tells them that Seo can't be the one who ordered the hit on Polka. Kuruya realizes that Seo took the real Polka with her to the bathroom, and he tells her the truth about the shark toy, making her upset. Kuruya thinks it's because she showered in front of him, but Seo says it's because he got to become a shark, wanting to exchange bodies with him. They discuss their next move, as Polka thinks about meeting with the Phantom Solitaire, because Polka sees the symbol as a precious memory, so he doesn't want anyone to defile it. They wonder if the Phantom Solitaire is from Polka's world, but Polka doubts it, saying he spent years creating the reincarnation magic he used, so he doesn't think anyone from his world could do the same. Kuruya does his research about the symbol, while Hozaragi tells Polka about his suspicions, thinking the police are involved. At the police HQ, Tsubaki makes his way to the office of the superintendent general named Jiro. Tsubaki enters his office, and Jiro asks him if he can function as a cog in their machine. Tsubaki says he's good at fitting in, but he mentions a pebble in the works. Jiro thinks he is talking about Hozaragi, asking him if Hozaragi was just a pebble to him, but Tsubaki reveals he was talking about the rat who drove Hozaragi away. Jiro informs him the Phantom Solitaire investigation has been reorganized, but he asks Tsubaki to play a key role. Meanwhile, Tanya receives information that someone from Shinjuku hacked the police, and he learns that it was done from a certain office of a fortune teller, so he thinks about paying the fortune teller a visit. Kuruya informs Polka that he can't find information about the symbol, but he knows it was part of a serious case that involved Hozaragi. Hozaragi confirms this, stating how he was killed by assassins in the building, and Kuruya speculates the culprit must have been a cop. Polka is worried about the Shino Yamas, thinking their involvement in the case could put the family in danger. Meanwhile, Tsubaki discusses the Phantom Solitaire case with the Metropolitan Police, telling them about his tendency to move closer if anything catches his eye, so he suggests following the symbol to cross paths with him. As he continues to discuss the case, Kozaburo overhears some of the officers making comments, questioning Tsubaki's eligibility to lecture them. Polka begins a fortune-telling session, telling his customer how he is about to get into trouble, suggesting he should change his ways. We learn that the customer is actually Tenya, noting how Polka's readings were accurate for the person he is disguised as, so he thinks he is just being fed information. He concludes that Polka is nothing special, letting out a sigh, so Polka asks if he has any questions. Tanya asks him about the symbol, and Polka tells him that there's something wrong with it, as the pen starts writing on a piece of paper, drawing the correct symbol. Tanya falls silent, and we learn Polka knew his true identity, but he couldn't tolerate the incorrect symbol, so he felt compelled to correct him. Tanya is about to leave, 
but Polka asks him about a pigtailed girl using a wheelchair, which shocks Tenya. The girl is revealed to be the spirit behind him, and although Polka can't understand what she's saying, he knows that the girl is distressed by the path he's walking. Polka is about to help her pass on, but Tenya says she must be his guardian spirit, as he leaves the room, and he realizes there's something special about Polka. As he is about to leave the building, Tenya is surprised to see a girl wearing the fire-breathing bug's raincoat, and we learn that the girl also asked Polka about the symbol. At the police HQ, Tsubaki tells Kozaburo about the error in the symbol, but he doesn't want to share it with the others, thinking the enemy could be anywhere. Two officers approach them, mocking Tsubaki's career, but Tsubaki reminds them he now has the authority to order them around. One of the officers grabs onto him, revealing how the officers still hate him because of his time with Hozaragi, but Tsubaki states that only crooked cops are mad at him. The officer pushes him back, telling him to know his place, but Tsubaki mocks their behavior. At that moment, two officers from Tsubaki's division, Yatsu and Tozawa arrive, and they casually break the officer's arm. But Tozawa claims the officer broke his own arm, pulling it back, as he calls it a problem solved. The senior commissioner Habaki asks them what's going on, and Tozawa explains they just performed first aid on an injured colleague. Tsubaki explains the situation to him in private, but he asks Tsubaki not to make waves, since he can't always cover him. That evening, Tenya is about to enter the torture building through the rooftop, when he suddenly gets attacked. He blocks it using his cards, and he calls out to Polka, thinking he was behind the attack, but Xiaoyu appears, which confuses Tenya. We see Polka sleeping in his room, when the real Polka notices writing on the wall, which appears to be from the fire-breathing bug. In a flashback, we see the Empire in danger, so the corpse god thinks about helping them out. His master tells him to get ready for life without the Empire, saying they have unlimited time, but she tells him to treasure the time of mortals, as she opens the door. However, the corpse god failed to follow her advice, since he wasn't able to save the people who were dear to him, and he even ended up as the enemy of the world. Back in the present, the real Polka wakes him up, allowing him to see the writing on the wall, which states that the world is a buggy program, and it asks him if he is a termite or a bird eating the bug. Polka receives a call from an unknown number, which seems to be from the fire-breathing bug. The man asks him if he is the bastard child of Sabramond, and Polka wonders how he even knows that name. Meanwhile, Xiaoyu attacks Tenya with his knives, forcing Tenya to jump away. Xiaoyu transforms his fingers into long knives, and Tenya panics as he dodges. We see a man observing the fight, and he informs Takaru about the situation, so he decides to make a move, saying they can benefit from the conflict. Polka tries to find out more about what he knows about Sabramond, wondering if he is also from the other world. But we see the girl in the fire-breathing bug's raincoat, who seems to be talking to the man, and Polka finds them hard to understand. He thinks the caller could be nearby, so he uses his eyes to look around for them, and he notices Tenya and Xiaoyu fighting on the roof. We see Tenya is panicking on the inside, and he has no idea what's going on, but he tries to play it cool. Xiaoyu wonders about his relationship with Polka, and decides to test him, mentioning Hozaragi. Tenya pretends like he knows Hozaragi, and Xiaoyu wonders if he is involved with Hozaragi's death. Tenya tries to explain himself, but Xiaoyu sees him as an enemy, so he charges at him. However, Lemmings suddenly lands between them, and they both know he is dangerous. We see Takaru as his associates wonder if Lemmings will attack Xiaoyu, but Takaru assures them he has ordered him not to harm Xiaoyu, and he is confident Lemmings will follow his orders. Lemmings turns to Tenya, and Xiaoyu sees it as an opening, attacking with his knives, but Lemmings is unfazed, continuing toward Tenya. Xiaoyu thinks he is being ignored, so he attacks again using his fingers. He is not able to cut through Lemmings, so he shocks him with electricity instead. But Lemmings gets free, and he continues toward Tenya, who starts to panic and asks to resolve things peacefully. Meanwhile, we see the girl as she gets approached by Yatsu and Tozawa. They find her suspicious being out on the streets in the middle of the night. She quickly ends her call, and Polka wonders what's going on. Thinking about how he doesn't want his memory to be defiled, he prepares to take action. He can sense someone flustered below him, and since the call ended at the same time, he deduces the caller is nearby. Not wanting to give up this clue, he activates his power. Everyone gets a strange feeling, as he covers the building, and creates a field known as his temple. 
we see the girl explaining to the two officers that she was just out looking for her dog that ran away, and she is soon joined by her father. Polka watches them with his eyes, and he knows they are lying, because he can't sense any dogs in the area, and he recognizes the souls of Tenya and the girl as the two people who asked him about the symbol. So he decides to expand his field to keep track of them. Everyone around feels a sudden unsettling feeling, but they can't tell what's going on. Polka heads to the roof to help Xiaoyu, but the real Polka worries he will be seen, so he prepares to use his invisible hands. Lemmings is attacked by the invisible hands, but he shrugs it off and continues toward Tenya. Tenya is also affected, and he wonders what is going on. Polka notes that his control has improved within his field, so he decides to take things to the next level. Tenya decides to retreat, throwing a smoke bomb and using a balloon to escape, but he suddenly becomes shocked, and Takaru also receives a shocking report. By sympathizing with the spirits, Polka is able to share senses with their hands, and he is able to give them a tangible form. We see a swarm of hands, as they try to capture Lemmings, but Polka realizes he still doesn't have the power to restrain him, so he decides to go after Tenya instead. Tenya is overjoyed seeing them, wondering about the secret behind them, but he manages to get away with another balloon. Polka is disappointed he got away, but he reveals he managed to catch the girl. We see footage of Polka's hands being spread across the internet, and it's connected to the skeleton event. There are people that recognize his power, looking to control it for themselves, and we learn the ones behind Hozaragi's death have started to make a move. And it seems like this is only the start of something much bigger. But that's where this series ends for now. I hope you enjoyed the video. Remember to like and subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.